Hello there, and welcome to our new monthly update video series. I'm Rodrigue Delru, community developer on Crusader Kings 3, and today we're going to tackle the four dev diaries that were published during the month of November. Join me. I actually had the chance to sit down with Alexander Oltner, lead designer for Crusader Kings 3, and Henrik Foreus, game director. The first subject we have discussed was Dynasty and Houses, which are two key pillars when you play Crusader Kings 3. Have a look. In CK3, the dynasty is an umbrella for houses, so each dynasty starts with a founding house. And the founding house um, has the same name as the dynasty, usually, and the houses are what characters are a part of. You create a cadet branch by being distantly related to the current uh, head of the dynasty. Usually your father has to be dead and uh, you have to have your own children. And when you do, you create a new name for yourself based on the place you're in and a new coat of arms and you become the head of your new house, which means that you have powers that you can exert over your uh, direct house members. The dynast uh, has power over the entire dynasty. This includes all the houses underneath it. They can disinherit, they can restore inheritance, they can denounce, they can demand conversions, they can even call dynasty members to wars or end wars between dynasty members. House heads also have these powers, albeit in a more limited fashion. For example, they can legitimize bastards. Renown is an interesting resource. So, to gain renown for your dynasty, Rather than collecting everything under you, like you used to in CK2, you want to spread your family far and wide. You want to push their claims for foreign thrones, you want to marry your kids to foreign rulers. And the more far and wide you have spread your dynasty, the higher your income of renown will be. Dynasty legacies. So with renown, you can, if you have enough of it, unlock dynasty legacies. And they are based on on historical dynasties all across the world. You can uh, focus your dynasty on, on war or on blood or kin. There are many paths you can go down. For the lawmakers, you will have an easier time ruling your realm. For the warmongers, you can gain um, special man at arms regiments like the House Guard. Next up, we have the medieval map, its ambition, its scope, and its early looks. The map is the star of all of our grand strategy games, even if CK is also about the characters. One thing you will notice immediately is that we put the actual baronies on the map. They're no longer in the uh, province view. In terms of sheer scope, it's, it's huge, right? Because we go all the way to eastern Tibet, which is actually not in CK2, and sub-Saharan Africa to some degree. We had this idea with CK2 that uh, the barons would provide good gameplay for counts if you were playing a count as a player. So we put them in the province view, not the actual map. It kind of worked, but these barons were never all that interesting, to be honest. Uh, and it felt a bit weird that they could raise their armies right on top of yours, because they had the same sort of spawning position on the map as your own armies. So uh, we decided to just go ahead and put them on the map. It's something we can do today, so why not? It also gives you more geographical considerations when you wage war. So the way you maneuver your armies around is, is a lot more interesting, with more, more provinces to walk through. We use terrain in a more interesting way, I think. So major rivers are impassable, except at the bridges or fords across them. Uh, there's a lot of impassable uh, mountain ranges and things like that that you, you need to uh, walk around, essentially creating interesting bottlenecks and geographical situations in the way you wage war. The next topic is going to tackle war, armies, battles and special units. Crusader Kings 2 had an issue with the warfare mechanic and the, and the combat system in that it was fairly interesting to look at these flanks fighting each other, but the composition of armies was out of your control. So you got these uh, batches of troops from your vassals, the, the levies, that consisted of all kinds of troop types. And you could not sort them into different lines or anything interesting. What we did is you raise levies, and levies are essentially just footmen. They are your standard light infantry type troops. But then in addition to that, you can hire professional troops of various types. Uh, and this is where, where you need to think about 
who you intend to fight, what your own realm looks like, uh, terrain types, you know, what kind of professionals uh, does your enemy employ. An interesting addition to the uh, professional troop system is the siege train, which will help you siege uh, enemy holdings faster. In fact, if you don't have the siege train, it's going to be a very painful process, at least in the beginning of the game, until you have unlocked uh, more innovations. Our ambition with CK3 was to uh, put characters everywhere in all the features where they were absent in, in CK2. And an obvious omission, uh, I think, was the knight. You think of knights in shining armor when you think of medieval times. So we put them in. They have a separate prowess value or skill. If they have 18 prowess, they fight as 18 <laughs> levy soldiers would. Um, and in addition to the knights, the, each army is also led by a commander who, who also participates to some degree in the fighting. Combat in, in CK3 works completely differently from CK2. I wouldn't say that it's more complex as such, but it's hopefully more interesting for players to interact with and look at. Basically, it's based around something we call advantage. And uh, at the start of combat, the commander's skills and other factors decide uh, who starts with more advantage than the other side. Um, and then there are commander roles during combat and other things can happen that pulls the advantage in, in different directions. The general dynamics of warfare, as in how you want to maneuver and move your armies, is uh, also a bit different than in CK2. We didn't want to encourage chasing around fleeing armies, or even chasing armies at all, or counter-attacking into enemy territory and so on. Uh, we also want to discourage attacks deep into enemy territory in general. That causes attrition if you move past fortified counties that you haven't taken, uh, your armies will start taking attrition. Last but not least, we're going to tackle holdings, baronies and counties, what they can do for you, what you can do with them. We're also going to talk about important concepts such as control and development. In CK2, the county was the smallest entity on the map. In CK3, it's the barony, and counties contain a few values that make it much more interesting to play with these. Um, development, control, and popular opinion. And then naturally there's also buildings. Each duchy has a capital where you can construct a special building that will give you a, an interesting bonus, depending on what you're looking for. And these buildings can be upgraded uh, like any other building to give more and more powerful bonuses. For example, you could build a siege workshop to make your siege weapons more efficient. You could build a, a military school to make your knights fight better. Development is a measure of technological progress in the county. It increases passively over time, uh, especially if you border another county with a higher development value. You can also choose to increase it yourself using your steward. Uh, and if you are playing tribal, development will not be a thing you have to worry about whatsoever. Development increases the taxes and levies you get from counties, and it also unlocks a few special options. Control is a more temporal thing. Control will increase and decrease very rapidly, very often, compared to development, which is really static. Usually when you conquer something in a war, it will be at zero control, and then you have to either wait for it to passively increase, or you send your marshal there to essentially reinstitute order among the peasantry. If the peasants are unhappy, you might face peasant revolts or even popular uprisings. So we have just scratched the surface of the Dev Diaries that were published in November. If you want to see the full text of it and delve really deeper into them, just click on the links below in the description. In addition, if you want to join our discussion, just pop on our forums or on our official Discord where you can have some chat with fellow friends and, and fans of Crusader Kings. We're also going to host a live chat session on Discord in a week's time where the devs are going to answer all your burning questions from these specific Dev Diaries. If you want to learn more about Crusader Kings, just go to crusaderkings.com and sign up where you can get super cool rewards. I'll catch you next month.